you're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Listeners, you got to stay tuned to this episode. If you are looking for a super powerful marketing idea, marketing plan, this is the one to listen to. We're going to cover SEO, the importance of your website, you know, how to improve guest counts in your restaurant, and more importantly, building your brand. So today's guest, super exciting. He's got lots to share. So stay tuned. Hey, welcome back everyone to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, engaging topics to help restaurants rock their profits, build their brands, and deliver amazing guest service experiences. I am super excited because I have a guest today that is going to help you do just that. His name is Mr. Eric Schellenberger, and he is an SEO expert and a web designer and a graphic artist, and he also has a lot of restaurant experience, and he weaves the two together, and he is going to tell us how we can increase guest counts, make your staff happier, how they can increase their tips, and we're also going to talk a lot about, you know, your website and the importance of that, and he's got lots of nuggets of wisdom along the way. So with that said, Mr. Eric Schellenberger, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, you know, you started in this career at a very young age, you know, and it sort of got you hooked. And much like yourself, you know, I think we both started off in the dish pit. So why don't you take us from there? Take us on your journey in the restaurant business. Yeah. So uh, I was 13 years old when I started this in this business as, of course, a dishwasher. Uh, my, my mother owned the food and beverage department services for a local ski resort in Park City, Utah. And it was called Park West back then, and now I think it's called Canyons. It's changed names a whole bunch of times. But um, So I was, uh, I was doing that for my whole childhood and then kind of turning into a ski-slash-snowboard bum in, in Park City when that lifestyle, you, uh, you have kind of two choices. Well, you have one choice. If you want to snowboard all day, you have to work at night. And the only uh, only jobs you can get when you're you know a young teenager with no experience is a restaurant job, which I got into that and and liked it and started you know washing dishes and then went to went to busing and went to the the kitchen and everything in between over the course of years. But that's where it started, and I I got you know out of the business for a couple of years, back into it, and then it was something I really had a passion for, so I continued that through uh, through my. You know, my into my 30s, and then that's where I where I started uh, getting into the corporate side of it and getting into marketing. I always knew I wanted to uh, to own a business that had something to do with the with restaurants, but I didn't know how to market. So I figured I'd learn how to market first, and I ended up starting a marketing company. Ironically enough, that's awesome. And what you do now is so relevant to restaurant management in general and about building brands. You know, we're going to do a little bit of talking about brand building today because it's just so important to differentiate your concept from all the competition out there. The competition is fierce in this business and so many aspects of your skill set are so applicable to that. So let's transition now. You, you got into marketing and then suddenly you became a web designer. Take us there. Yeah, I was a I went to I was actually a web design intern at 35 years old, which was a, a a weird situation being that old and making zero money for an entire year, but it was probably the best investment of time I've ever made. I I learned web design, I learned graphic design. Um I basically was just working at a really small agency that uh it was either going to school or that, and I'm glad I chose that because I learned everything I could over the course of a year instead of you know four years, and it didn't cost me any money. I just wasn't making any money. So anyway, right out of that, I got a job at the corporate location for Toby Keith's I Love This Bar and Grill chain, and I don't know if, if uh, anybody's heard of those or not. Oh, but, we absolutely have. Okay, so um, those are uh, – I, I, was, I was the marketing department. I was, uh, at the time, I, I went from one location up to 13 locations, and I was the guy. I was the entire department. I was the, the web designer. I was the, the guy who made the flyers. I was the guy who booked the bands, did the social media. Um, every single aspect of marketing, I did all of it. I, you know, I put the, 
put the flyers on the TV screens and, and figured out all the technical aspect of connecting all these admin dashboards and whatever. So um, it, it was a it was a very mismanaged place. So it, it's one of those ones I, I hesitate to mention on my, put on my resume. But, uh, you know, I, I finally uh, when I quit there, I was replaced by six people because nobody had all that skill set under one person. Um, anyway, I, I quit there and I went to work for a company that that manages a lot of the bars and nightclubs in the entertainment district in Scottsdale, right in Old Town. And uh, I was there for a couple of years and then I moved to a company that I'm actually there now. Um, I'm still working for a, a, one of these companies as an employee, which I, I probably won't be there too much longer because my, my main business has taken off so much that I'll get into that. But mm. um, yeah, so, so we manage the... The, the most profitable and the most popular dance dance clubs, nightclubs, and bars in the, uh, the the Scottsdale Entertainment District right now. So you're weaving a lot of incredible um, experience in hospitality together. So it's one thing to run a successful restaurant. It's another thing to have a successful bar, which obviously has uh, a lot of profit attached to it. And now we're also talking about nightclubs. And you've combined that experience to all three, but not only the management aspects of that, but then the marketing aspects as well, the social media, the websites, you know, the search engine optimization. We're going to get into online reviews. There's so much depth of experience. I want to tap into all your wisdom. Awesome. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, yeah, the nightclub customer, as you know, is a lot different than the restaurant customer. And the approaches you take to, to, to you know, rope that guy in are completely different. Absolutely. So where do you want to begin? I mean, we, we're talking about lots of different marketing aspects that are really relevant to any listener today. Shall we start with, uh, let's go with website design. You know, you and I um, were talking the other day and I think my idea was, you know, it's simple. Simple is better. You know, obviously you want to have a menu that people can see. You want open hours on there. You want a schedule of events on there. But I've always believed, Eric, that you know, a website is the primary communication with a customer who doesn't know the first thing about you. They may have heard about you. They're going to check out your website as well as your regular customers. So I've always believed that it's really important to give people what the experience of your restaurant or bar or nightclub is really like, even though they've never actually walked through the door. Kind of like a virtual tour. Give them the experience online before they walk in. Give them lots of reasons to come in. That's right. So photos is uh, uh, getting a professional um, photo shoot done is absolutely the most important thing you could do for your website. And it, the, the whole website, uh, you know, people have, especially in the restaurant business, for some reason, people have this, this mindset of they have to make this work of art website and it has to be perfect and it has to be so visually stunning it'll just blow people away when they find it. And they don't put any money into SEO, so people will never ever find this awesome work of art they've done. So um, I'll get into that in a second. But so back to content, yeah. When when you have professional uh, photographs that make up the majority of your content, that that does tell a story. You know that gives them the 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 uh, I guess the virtual tour of what the place is going to look like, what the vibe is about, what the food is about. Uh, you know that you obviously get a great food photo shoot. And you put all that stuff together, and uh, you know, and let somebody ha get you know, so they're not guessing. By the time they walk in the door, they've got a great idea of what the place is. You're able to show it off, and the great thing about that is not that many people are utilizing high-res professional photos. So you'll automatically, right out of the gate, look better than your competition. So important, so important. Okay, so let's talk about finding your website once it's there. Obviously, you need an investment, and these are some of the most you know important marketing dollars you can spend: your web presence and then on search engine optimization. So let's uh, let's explore that a little bit more. Yeah, your website shouldn't cost more than about fifteen hundred bucks. That's the going rate for your average. I prefer WordPress as a as a uh, uh, like a platform. And uh, I've been doing WordPress websites for a decade now. I've done I don't know how many hundreds of them. And that's that's what I charge. If someone just says, no, no, I want the $5,000 model, I'll talk them out of it. And you do not need it. You, you know, your money should go into SEO 100%. I think that uh, if you're spending more than 1500 bucks for a website, you're doing it wrong. Um, it doesn't need to be all things to all people. It doesn't have to have some crazy amount of, you know, shopping cart, blah, blah, blah on it. Yeah, and, um, bells and whistles. 
Yeah, it's just it's just not not necessary. Uh, the the main the main thing is you're doing you're making your website for a reason. It's to be found. So the reason I mean the, why people don't put their money into being found is beyond me. But um, yeah, yeah, I tell I tell people if you're going to have a big budget, you put ninety percent of that budget into being found. So your search engine optimization is absolutely crucial. I read a statistic that said by 2020, websites will be irrelevant because Google is is providing so much information right now without even getting to the website that it's just going to become obsolete. You know, when you type in uh, somebody's restaurant, you've got that knowledge panel, which is like the map and the pictures and the hours and everything yes, to the right. Yes, of course. Okay, so yeah. that piece uh -huh. – is getting more and more robust and it's getting to have more and more information to where you don't even have, you know, most people are going to looking for your contact information or your hours or a couple photos or your Yelp reviews. All that stuff is right there. Yes. So there's any more, there's no reason to even click through to the website. Can you the website imagine is, that it's really changing that dramatically and that quickly? Yeah, it's crazy. So the, the website is becoming less and less important. And, and, you know, don't, and I want the, the listeners to make sure I'm not saying don't have one. By all means, have one. And your, your, all your SEO is tied back into the information on your website, so you definitely need to have one. But the focus on making it a work of art is less and less important these days. So explain the vi validity and importance of keywords and how generic those need to be or how focused on your concept they need to be for someone to find the average restaurant's website. Yeah, great question. So SEO is is very complicated. To most people, it's such voodoo they don't even understand it. They don't want to understand it. I don't blame them. Um, the one of the, uh, the the main kind of principles it works on, or the, the the main approach I take as an SEO guy is you have to find a keyword that's got a lot of monthly clicks, a lot of traffic, yet not a lot of competition. That's the sweet spot is to find a, a very good blend between the two. If you type in you know, the word restaurants near me is obviously gets 11 million searches a month. It's insane. So that's that's the most uh, um, uh, mm. most competitive keyword out there. So if you're going just for that word, uh, you're going to be up against every single other restaurant out there. Um, of course, it has to do with if your GPS is on on your phone, then it's going to pick up the closest ones to you. So you could get lucky. Uh, but if you're going to type in something like restaurants in, say, Scottsdale, where I'm from, Right. then you're up against all sorts of competition. One of my clients that I just uh, got them to the very top of the search results, I found that the word Scottsdale patio bars was uh, getting 6,000 searches a month and there was no competition for it. So I optimized for that word in particular and I got them to number one within 30, 60 days, something like that, which is, which is tough. Usually SEO is a very, very long-term uh, you know, approach. And you also recommend allocating a monthly budget. It's not something that you do, you put in place, and then you walk away from. It should be just monthly maintenance, correct? Absolutely. It's something that goes on and on forever. It's not something that you that you do once and forget about it. It's and it's called, you know, the 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 organic search results are called organic for a reason. They're always changing. They're always evolving. You could be number one one day and number ten the next day. It's it's really all over the board, and it's the guy that puts the most attention to it. And the guy that, that is constantly working it, and uh, what uh, one of the services I offer is Listing Syncs, which is it'll put your. Uh, let me get into that, which is backlinks. And mm -hmm. backlinks yes, is the uh, the amount of other websites and directories and other platforms that point towards you or that have a link that that links back to your website. So if I've got five or six backlinks, you know, I've got my link on on my profile page for Facebook. I've got my link on my TripAdvisor and my Yelp and, and uh, OpenTable or whatever, then you've got five or six links. And Google thinks, well, okay, if you, you know, if nobody else cares about this website, why should I? So I, I add my clients to 70-something directories, and I lock the information in so none, nobody can uh, – I'll get to that in a second. So all those backlinks are – you know, once you have 70 different directories and, and places online pointing to your website, all of a sudden Google's like, okay, this is a very – uh, inf important site. People care about this one. I'm going to put it all the way at the top of the, of the search results. Um, one of the other things that, that Google and Facebook have both opened themselves up to lately, which I think is a terrible idea, is user-generated content or what they call suggested edits. So I don't know if you've been in a restaurant and, it's, and it, when you get a notification from Google or from Facebook that pops up and says, hey, are you at blah, blah, blah? And if you hit yes, it'll ask you, this happened to me as a customer several times, 
it'll say, are these hours correct? And me as a customer can change the hours of a restaurant I'm sitting at, which is completely insane that they let you do that. But I tried it, sure enough, and I, I was at a place that, you know, of course I was honest about it, and I, I knew the guy working there, and I said, hey, are these your hours? Yeah. Then it asked me, is this the address? And the suite number was missing from the address. So I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll add it for you. I don't know. You know, I figured, okay, this is going to go into pending mode for 90 days, and they're going to aggregate it with a bunch of information and make a decision. I get a, a notification from Google about 45 minutes later, and it says, your changes have been applied. So I look on their Google page. Sure enough, the edit I just made is now live on their Google page. That's crazy. Anybody can change information at any time, which, yeah, right, it's crazy. And I have a service that locks people out of that. So I, so that doesn't happen because it, it happens all the time with, with uh, people changing the hours to the wrong hours. Unbelievable. I shouldn't be surprised, right? It's a crazy <laughs> right. world. <laughs> yep, yep, it is. And, and I mean, again, it's so weird that, that Google and Facebook usually are better than that. But yeah. I, I, I almost think there's so much wrong information out there that they're, they're weighing the two and, and letting people have at it. So, Eric, online reviews are probably just as important, if not more so, than a website. And I heard somewhere that it's a very high statistic. Somewhere north of 85% of people believe online reviews as much as a recommendation they would get from a friend or a family member. It's a matter of fact, it's exactly 85%. Yeah, they're, they're the most important thing next to word of mouth for driving new traffic. So one of, the, I, I did a video series recently called Hacking Human Nature. And out of that video, it's a five part video series and I basically break down the pie chart of what brings somebody into a bar or restaurant, a new face, someone who's never heard of you before, someone who's never been there. And, and it's the, 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 the pie chart breaks down with, obviously word of mouth is king. It's always going to be. Word of mouth is two thirds of the new people walking in the door. The second one at 22% is online reviews. So that, and then, you know, three is, is, is the third one is Google, like we talked about. Um, online reviews are absolutely king. And the, the problem is that most, almost all the restaurants that I approach don't either have a pulse on the, on their online reviews or they don't optimize them and they don't work them to their advantage. They're, they're so easy to respond to those reviews and to actually have a presence on there, right. but nobody does it. It's, it's so important yet so missed these days. It, it blows my mind how, how, how ignored it is. So how can we shift the paradigm, shift the mindset of the average restaurant owner operator? Because I work with so many and, you know, I'm biased, of course, because I've always believed what we're talking about now is internal marketing. You are you're spending very little, if any money at all, on things that have the greatest impact on customer traffic, building your brand, that sort of thing, using your staff to become brand ambassadors for your business. You show your customers a great time, then you can be sure they're going to be tell, telling their friends and family, you got to go to that place. The service was amazing. The food was amazing. I mean, you know where I'm going with this. But so many people that are in this business continue to spend tens of thousands of dollars on that traditional radio, print, TV, direct mail stuff. And I stopped that like, you know, 18, 19 years ago in my restaurant. I just focused on internal marketing and I developed this powerhouse brand that dominated the competition. And that's really what I talk about now. And I think that you're on the same wavelength with that. I mean, these things we're talking about, online reviews is just free marketing. It, all it takes is the time and the creativity and just putting your best spin forward to give your customers an idea of what's great about your restaurant and responding to any negative reviews. I want to talk about all this stuff. Yeah, so uh, absolutely right. And yeah, the, the how people are still putting money in traditional print or traditional media advertising is insane to me too. I just don't, I don't understand that. And People should ask themselves, do, do I listen to that? Do I respond to that? Does that resonate with me? Good and when point. I ask that back to them, they're like, well, no. So, okay, so does it resonate with your demographic? Because you're probably your demographic. Well, no. And that's so. That's how the conversation goes. So yes, back, that, back to the, uh, the, the on, online review part is um, – so think about it this way. The reason why I respond to all – I respond to all of my online reviews for my clients a lot of time, yeah, they're going to say, look, I just don't have time for that. And if you, if you, like most restaurant managers, yeah, you don't. So that's one of the services I offer. But if you do have time for it, by all means do it. And I recommend responding publicly to every single review, good and bad. The reason why is the, 
if you're responding to just the, the negative ones, it's sending a message that you're not important enough to get a response unless you're pissed off. Great point. So I want to make sure that the, I want to thank my fans, thank the ones with a positive review and invite them back in. I put my contact information on every single response. So my name, my email address, my cell number, every single response. That way, and here's what happens. Everybody's like, oh, no, no, I'm going to get blown up. My phone's going to ring nonstop. I'm just going to get bugged by everyone. My phone, num my cell number is on probably tens of thousands of reviews out there with the Scottsdale nightclubs of the most trendy, most hard to contact places in the world over the course of five years. I probably get one phone call a month. Recently, I've gotten about one a week, and guess what those phone calls are? They're they're like, hey, I can't I can't get a hold of a VIP host. I want to book a table with a thousand dollar minimum. Can you help me? Absolutely, I can help you. I'll put them in touch with the VIP host, and we we get them in that way. Or it's, hey, I was just about to write a one star review. I had a terrible experience, but I figured I'd call you first. I'm able to field that review and prevent it from showing up on Yelp just by posting my cell number. And so I, I, I want people to get out of the mindset of I'm not going to post my number anywhere. I'm scared. I'm just going to get bugged to death. It's not going to happen like that. How much time do you recommend someone devote to you know monitoring and responding to reviews, positive and negative, on a weekly basis? You know, obviously time is critical in this business, but we're talking about a critical aspect of marketing and positive um, word of mouth and all that. But what would you say you know is reasonable to spend for time? Well, you know, you, you've got the big four review platforms, Google, Facebook, Yelp, and TripAdvisor. And everybody's like, well, I don't, you know, it takes so much time to go log in. Oh, I forgot my password. What's my password again? You know, then it's is this email is it the other email. Then, it, you know, nobody's really that organized to get all this stuff. Uh, so it, it is a giant pain in the ass for them. But there, there are systems out there, there are platforms out there that will, that will aggregate your reviews into one dashboard. I use those. So for me, I, I'm cheating. I, can, I have such a, awesome software that mine just come in in a big feed, and all I have to do is click them and respond to them through a dashboard. So I've got a huge advantage. Not everybody is going to not only buy that software but would go through the motions. So for the average person, I would say just keep an eye on it. Respond within 72 hours. That's the, that's the rule of thumb. So if you, if, you have the, if you don't have the time, get an employee to do it. Hire somebody to do it. Get it done one way or another because it's the most important thing next to word of mouth like I talked about. So think of it like this. If, it's, if, if when someone's about to write a one-star review and they notice you're responding to all of these, they notice you have a presence on there, you're paying attention, you're right there, it's a lot harder to talk trash about someone when they're standing right next to you. You know, Think of it in those terms. So if, you know, if they know you're, I've noticed my responses, my reviews changed from, you know what, I was going to give you guys a one-star review and tell you guys how bad your service is, but I noticed that you guys really do care, so I'm going to give you a three, and then it gives me a chance to reach out to them. Is there another or additional ways, Eric, of increasing the, uh, the number or the star factor, shall we say? So, you know, it's, it's much like SEO coming to the top of the search engine list. It's like reviews are like five stars at the top and then down to the bottom. And that's clearly where you want to be. There's your sweet spot. Are there other ways we can influence the number of five stars reviews that we get in an honest sort of way? Right. And Yelp has really, really strict terms and conditions when it comes to soliciting a review. You're not allowed to solicit reviews. But you are allowed to ask for them and not reward someone with them. You are allowed to ask for a review, good or bad. You're just not allowed to manipulate them. So um, that being said, one of my biggest secrets of all time that I'm going to share with you guys is there's a wireless router called ZenReach. I don't know if you ever heard of that system. I have not. But Okay, so ZenReach, Z-E-N-R-E-A-C-H.com. It's a wireless router that goes in the, in the business – any customer that comes in there, they when they hook up to the Wi-Fi, all it'll say is either give me your email address or log in with Facebook. Then they're on. That's it. There's one step. So when they log into that wireless router, it captures that information. It, of course, aggregates it and makes a database of all your emails. So you're actually collecting a database of real customers that have been in your door. These are the, the most high-value emails you could possibly have. They're not people who maybe have heard of you or maybe your demographic or maybe live in you know Timbuktu. They're people that have been in your business. So – that's all great for uh, email blasts, but what it does that's awesome is 
it sends what it calls smart emails out automatically on certain schedules. So the first time customer, when they've been in the door, three hours after they leave, it'll send them an email and it'll say whatever you want it to say. And mine, I set it up for, the default is, hey, thanks for coming into blah, blah, blah. Hope you had a good time. That's it, which I think is a horrible message. So mm, I agree. what I do is I, I consulted with them recently about six months ago and asked them to build in a reputation management aspect of it. And I think this was popular enough that they finally did it. It got launched on Monday. And what it is, is it'll say, thanks for visiting, you know, whatever restaurant. How did we do rate your experience? And there's a one to five star rating. So when they choose that one to five star rating, if it's one, two or three, it'll email you and pull that in internally. You have a chance to, to uh, respond to that customer and make it right before it ends up on Yelp. It's amazing. It's amazingly effective. And if they give you a four or five star, it'll say, thank you, please share your message. And it'll actually do, uh, uh, redirect them to Yelp, Facebook, TripAdvisor, or Google. Fantastic. Awesome. So what, what, here's, here's one yeah. thing that's even better. Yeah. Is th th these, these smart emails, it gives you the first-time customer, the, 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 the regular customer, which I believe is you can put X amount of times they've been in the door, but I put about five. Okay. Then it has the loyal customer that's been there more than 10. It has a lost customer that's been there two times in the last 30 days, but not ever again in 30 days, and then has birthdays. And so what you can do is you can tailor different offers to these people based on their, their visit frequency. So what I do is I set up the reputation management part for obviously the one-time customer and the loyal customer because the loyal customer, I mean, they're obviously like you. They're a loyal customer. They're, they're, there's a 100% chance they're going to give you a great review. So I send that, hey, rate, please rate us to the loyal customers, the one times, and it really helps the star ratings. It's an amazing, legitimate way to manipulate those numbers. Fantastic. That's awesome. Let's move on from there. Now, you've got a couple of catchphrases that I absolutely love. And, you know, I've always had my mantras over the years. But let's start with help others by being ruthlessly self-serving. What do you mean by that, Eric? Yeah, that this goes back to the, the staff training that I do. So... Um, going back to the 66% of what drives traffic is word of mouth. The word of mouth is dictated by the staff, not us. You know, the word of mouth is dictated by the actual human interaction between the customer and the server or the bartender. Um, so I, I, as a marketing guy, it killed me that I couldn't manipulate the 66%, which was the huge piece of that pie. And so I got thinking about it and I, I thought, okay, the staff, you know, it's up to them. What can I do? So I started doing, uh, like talks, presentations to the staffs of my clients. And it, it, my, my, my talk has, it has nothing to do with the money of the business or the money of management. It's all based around the reason why they're there is their tips. So I teach them how to get more tips. My goal is to have them double the amount of tips they're making during a shift. And when you start talking on those terms, they all of a sudden start paying attention. So, course, so uh, yes. my, my, you know, my whole message to them is change your mindset, change the way you think about customers, coworkers, and management. And it's, it's a really simple process. And this is something that, that probably every manager has told them a hundred times. They're like, yeah, yeah, I said that to them. But my analogy is think about it like this is I could tell, you know, my, my girlfriend or wife, Hey, you should come to the gym with me. I'll show you some, some really cool things that would help your workout. She's, I'm going to lose that conversation every time. She's going to be like, yeah, whatever. I'm not, you know, you're not, you don't know what you're doing or I've yeah. heard it before. It doesn't work. Right. But the minute my buddy who's a, who's a personal trainer tells her the same exact thing that I told her in the same word, she's going to think he's a genius. Isn't that the way it is? <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm the expert in the field. I'm the third party guy that's going to reinforce what management has been telling them the entire time. Only I'm going to do it from a little bit different perspective and a different approach. And when I when I talk about, I uh, uh, you know, uh, affecting their tips, then, you know, it's, and it's easy. It's through, it's through not only a mindset shift, but it's, it's keeping, it's doing a couple of really key things. Remember the drink, remember the name, remember the conversation. So when, you know, if, if I'm a, a one-time customer and I come back the second time and the bartender says, Hey Eric, uh, good to see you back. Jack and Coke, right? And then it's like, Wow. And all of a sudden, the customer is like, my God, you do care. Like you guys actually cared enough to con con commit that to memory, remind, you know, remember it. And then when I say, hey, last time we talked, you know, you, you mentioned your mother was in the hospital. How's she doing? Mm -hmm. 
then it's like, man, your tip just went through the roof. Right, right. And it's very rarely practiced, but it's so true. It's little stupid things like that are so effective. I agree. And, the and, personal touch. Right. And, and it's, it's, it's these things that are – I want to say it's the 2% that causes the 100% of difference. And it's really these itty-bitty details. Yes. Smiling. It, one of the one of my one of the big 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 things with this is stay off the phone, and I know that's a huge struggle with management. And every single place is trying to get their staff to stay off the phone. I know, but yes. I've I've I, I you know that's what I what I tell them is as far as being going back to uh, being ruthlessly self serving, I tell them does it serve you if you're on your phone and you've got a customer or a bunch of customers that are watching you, make your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed more important than they are. And of course, they'll agree, no, it doesn't. Okay, so why are you doing it? Why are you on your phone? Why is it that important to you? I get it that it's addictive, but you've got to take a, you know, a, a conscious, make a conscious decision to stay off the phone. If it's an emergency, go to the back of house, knock it out, come back out, but stay off your phone, not because it's a policy, because it serves you. And that's when it starts to resonate with them. There are so many different impressions that affect a guest's experience, you know, and I do call this the, the restaurant business being one of a thousand details, and it's the 10 you miss that the customer always sees, even if you get the other 990 correct, and you're talking about, yeah, these little details that are sort of pet peeves with customers that show that they're not important. I mean, you got to get your hands on all these things and just, you know obviously continue to reinforce with the staff what the guest experience is like. Put yourself in the customer's shoes, you know, and I always train my staff also to notice, to see the things that the customer is going to see before they see it and fix things that are broken if, the, you know, it's within their power to do so. All these things made a huge difference with our business and, you're, you know, you're definitely speaking my language on that one. How yeah. About, it, I'll, oh, go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. I was going to say all these things, you, yeah. you're absolutely right. They're, it's it's so easy to to you know when you let that one detail slide then the customer is going to nitpick the smallest little things you, you did 99 percent right but you're absolutely right that one percent is going to kill you man impressions are lasting and negative ones for you know unfortunately a negative impression is always more powerful or has been proven to be more powerful than a positive one you know and you can have so yep. many positive impressions and one bad one is what they're gonna remember I don't know why that is it's human nature <laughs> or something but I'm sure you've seen that too of course yeah it's unfortunate but it's true yeah so your next mantra be the show not the commercial yeah this is going back to social media so uh, I've, I've worked at a couple places over the years that they are they, they want to post flyers nonstop, flyer, 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 flyer. And I, I'm looking in their feed, and I'm, I'm the guy that's the marketing director, and I've had talk after talk with these guys like, man, okay, here's, here's the difference. Here's how Facebook sees your flyers. So when you post a flyer with text on it, and it's a, you know, you've got a title, and you've got all your content on it, and blah, blah, blah. You're promoting a happy hour. You're promoting a game, a UFC fight, whatever. So Facebook is going to take that. Facebook is incredibly smart. Their, 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 uh, their system will crawl that picture. They recognize if it's a flyer versus a, a photograph. It knows. So if it's a flyer, it puts it into bucket A, and bucket A, gets the reach gets censored down so much that it's about 1% of your fan base, your actual followers, will see that message at all. So the, it, it, just, it just choked down so much that it, your message is never going to get out there. And it, this makes perfect sense why they do this. On the other hand, you, you post a photograph of a really high-res professional shot of your food. It looks amazing. That goes into bucket B. Bucket B, the, the audience is wide open. Okay, not wide open because, of course, Facebook wants you to pay for wide open. But yeah. <laughs> to get a lot more uh, uh, eyeballs on, that, on that, uh, that piece, that's all you have to do. So you're automatically you know, steps 10 times ahead of the game if you post a photograph. If you need to put information that goes with that photograph, type it in the text, you know, in the in the actual post. If you if you have a new happy hour, instead of doing a happy hour flyer, do a fo a food photo of your most amazing looking happy hour dish. Type in happy hours from three to seven, blah 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 blah, blah in the text in that post. That is going to get so many more eyeballs on it and be so much more effective that that it's uh it, it, I don't I can so, tell people statistics all day long but a lot of these people have it in their brain that no 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 if i have happy hour i have to put it on a flyer and i have to say it on the flyer but 
the whole going back to your original thing, the whole reason why I came up with that be the show, not the commercial, is because when you're when you're advertising, you're promoting, you're you know, look at me, look at me kind of thing, and you're posting these flyers all day long, you're being the commercial. And not only is Facebook not going to like that, but people don't like that. Human nature does not like to be advertised to, and that's all you're doing is you're advertising and you're promoting yourself. You know, you're 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 promoting yourself without contributing any value. When you add an awesome picture of food, that's contributing value, and then people are going to resonate with that, and people are going to get curious and look into it on on their own terms, and it's going to be their own decision to 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 learn more. And not because you force them to. So uh, keep that, keep the, the whole thing in mind that the minute you stop selling is when sales happen. Yes, being authentic and not salesy, critically important. Great, great yep. advice. Yep, yep. So we've covered a lot of ground today, Eric. It's been awesome. What else do you want to tell us that uh, we might have missed? Well, I, I think that uh, that the the main thing that I've been focusing on lately, like I said, is that whole what drives new customers, what drives guest count pie chart. So that's the most important thing that that I really want to reiterate and make people make sure people know that 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 uh, keep this in mind that most of these conversations are so social media based and everybody is so intense about social media that if you're trying to appeal to new faces and people that have never heard of you before. Social media comprises about 4% of the new customers walking to your door. It's almost non-existent because no one puts the pieces together of if you're trying to get new customers through social media and these people don't already like you or follow you on social media, how are they ever going to see your message? And that's something that, that nobody really puts two and two together. But then when you think of it on those terms, look, these people don't know me. They haven't seen me. They're, they're, they're not going to see my posts. That's why I want people to take a very, very close look at search engine optimization and online reviews because that's the two spots everybody is going to look, you know, of course, word of mouth aside, those are the two things that you and I can manipulate that that the new customers, that's where they are. So when people start taking that that shift in focus away from so social media heavy onto that, that's when they're going to see the magic happen. Fantastic, Eric. So you are a one-stop shop for a complete restaurant marketing plan that is super effective. How can my listeners find you? My website is called barmarketingbasics.com, and I've got a, a lot of t a lot of content on there. I do video blogs all the time. I've got I don't know how many dozens of tips and tricks and stuff like that on there. Um, some of it is a paid service. Some of it's free, but um, it, it's I mean, the site is pretty robust. It has a whole bunch of content on it. And just, just like I teach, content is king. And the more content you have, as far as something where you're trying to, to drive traffic to, the better. Um, also, my, I'm really big on Facebook. And I, I know you're going to put the, the links on this. It's, it's uh, face, yeah, yeah, Facebook.com forward slash Eric Schellenberger or forward slash Bar Marketing Basics. Okay, so definitely check out my show notes for a summary of the uh, the call we're having today as well as how to find Eric. Eric, super, super exciting having you as a guest. You've shared so many nuggets of wisdom that really help restaurant owners, operators, and managers run super powerful brands and improve their marketing programs, man. It's been great having you. Thank you. Awesome. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, anytime. So that was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. And while you're there, download a copy of the book, Rock Your Restaurant. It's a game changer. See you next time.